Freddy vs. Ash, the fan novelization by A.S. Eggleston. Chapter 3. Ash strode across the store, making a beeline towards the door that led outside. He needed some fresh air to clear his head. He zigzagged his way past the crowd of people in front of him. He was almost out. He zoomed by Buck, the janitor, who was talking to Anthony, the nerdy guy who worked in the electronics department. Actually, it was more like Buck was listening to Anthony as he droned on and on. Buck was bored out of his mind, feeling like his story would never end. Uh, uh, Lord, kill me now, he thought to himself. So I said to the guy, Anthony continued. He took his thick rimmed glasses off, breathed on them, cleaned them on his button-up shirt, and put them back on. I said, if you don't watch the first movie, you'll be totally lost. I mean, yeah, the second one is far superior, but you have to watch them all in chronological order in order to get it, right? And he was just like... Buck was on the verge of slipping into a coma when he noticed that peculiar guy with the metal hand and the big chin walking by. He'd heard about him, rumors and such. Buck wanted to talk to him face to face. That, and it was a good excuse to get out of hearing Anthony run his mouth. He whipped around, cutting Anthony off in mid-sentence. He stopped leaning against the mop handle and stood up straight. His voice was deep and gruff. Hey, you! he called. Ash stopped and slowly turned around. He saw this big husky guy with a beard and a trucker hat staring at him. Yeah, he said hesitantly. What's your name? Ash glared at him for a second. What does this guy want? Name's Ash. Housewares. Ash, he said, memorizing his name. You're the one who lives at that house, 1428 Elm, right? He looked at Buck inquisitively. How's that his business? Ash took a step forward and held his head up high. Yeah, how'd you know? It's a small town where it gets around pretty quickly. Well, what about it? Buck scratched his dark, scruffy beard, trying to find the right words to say. He was about to say something when Anthony beat him to the punch. That place is a murder house, man. Every time someone moves in there, it turns into a crime scene, he blurted. I think... What my uh, socially awkward friend here means, Buck added, is that house isn't exactly, Buck searched for the right word, safe, he continued questioning Ash. You got kids? He answered firmly, no. How long you been living there? He asked. About a week or so, he said. Just passing by, actually. Buck hesitated for a moment before asking him the next question. And in that week or so, he said sternly, have you had any nightmares? Look, I didn't come here for a head shrinking, okay? Ash said annoyed. So just drop the jeopardy. He prepared to turn and walk away when Anthony came forward. Wait, 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 Ash, wait a minute. Anthony stopped him. Ash whipped around and looked down at Anthony, glaring at him. He terrified him, but he still kept going. Look, Ash, he said weakly, there's something that you should probably hear, and you should hear it from us because no one else in this town ever wants to speak about it, at least not in great detail. Ash was unfazed. He continued to give Anthony the evil eye. I'm listening. A few years ago, he said, Something bad happened here. Look, Anthony, we're not around a campfire, so cut it out with the ghost stories. And start explaining. Chop, chop. Well, uh, Anthony was a bit intimidated at this point. He was about to spit out the town's dirty little secret to some stranger. Sometime today, maybe? Ash said. Buck rolled his eyes. Now he's at a loss for words. Anthony cleared his throat. You see, a few kids were uh, slaughtered a, a while back. His voice was hushed. A few? Buck cut in. Try 42 plus 10 more kids back when that big guy watched his way in here. Shut the hell up, man. Anthony turned to Buck, his voice still hushed. Ash was growing impatient, so he walked over to Buck. All right, you. He pointed to him. I want some answers. Now. 
he stood still leaning on the mop handle. About ten years back, there were a string of murders that spread from here all the way to Crystal Lake in New Jersey. Over a dozen kids and one cop were slashed to death. They were stabbed, disemboweled, and chopped to death with some kind of blade. And the first murder, he paused, was in that house. Boy, I know how to pick them, don't I? Ash thought. Okay, he said. So who did it? Was it like a, uh, Ash was trying to find a word to describe deadites without actually saying it. The police never caught him, Anthony joined in, but they thought it was some copycat killer of somebody else. I can't remember who it was, he said, lying. So one kid gets killed in that house, and you're trying to tell me that it's haunted, he asked. Ash wasn't denying the existence of supernatural forces, but he's seen scarier things than spirits. It was more than one kid, Ash. People have been dying in that house for years, Anthony said. Look, buddy, I've seen uglier things and some ghosts sneaking up behind me in the hallway, Ash said. If you ever have a real problem, then come to me. Otherwise, lose it with the unsolved mysteries. Ash turned around and prepared to walk away. He could faintly hear Buck and Anthony talking amongst themselves. I don't know, Buck. Maybe we should just tell him. I'm not going to do it, though. You do it, Anthony whispered. Ash kept right on walking. He didn't need to deal with this, but he couldn't get that one question out of his mind. Have you experienced any nightmares? Maybe that was just a coincidence, or maybe he was on to something. Ash swallowed his pride and went back. He looked at Buck and asked, Why did you ask if I'd been having nightmares? Buck and Anthony looked at each other and nodded. It was time to tell him the whole truth. He looked around, noting how many people were in the store. Follow us to the break room, instructed Buck. We'll tell you everything you need to know about this place. They did tell him everything. They told Ash that many years ago, the nice little town of Springwood had a child killer running amok. The police had no leads. No one had a clue who it could be. Before they knew it, every child on Elm Street was missing, gone. Eventually, the police had one suspect. His name was Fred Krueger. He worked in the boiler level of the city's power plant. He lived in a nice little house on Elm Street with his wife and daughter. Well, sort of. Kruger strangled his wife to death, and his daughter was seized for adoption. The police broke into Kruger's home without a warrant. In the basement, they found locks of hair with bows and ribbons still in them, pieces of clothing, little kids' toys. They all belonged to the 29 boys and girls that were reported missing. The police even found the murder weapon, actually several of them, different variations of the same contraption, a metal glove with knives on the fingers. All of them had speckles of blood on them. The cops raced over to the power plant and caught Kruger with his blades pierced inside the body of child number 30. Fred Kruger was taken to court, and it seemed like there was no way he could get out of it. He gave his testimony to the judge and still claimed that he had done nothing wrong. He pulled out every trick in the book. He pled insanity. His mother was a nun who was locked in a mental institution and raped hundreds of times by the criminally insane. He claimed that none of the items were his, that he had merely put on the glove for self-defense. The parents in the public gallery weren't buying it, and neither was the jury. On the outside, he looked like just any other guy, blonde hair, blue eyes, pale, unsuspecting face, but inside was the most vile and twisted human being who ever lived. He just sat there with phony sincerity for the lies of those little kids. Unfortunately, because the police searched his home without a warrant, all of the evidence they found was inadmissible in court. Kruger was free, just like that, even though he should have been put to death for what he did. 
he walked down the steps of the courthouse, arrogant and smiling. Later that day, he returned to the power plant to begin a new killing spree. It had been a while, and Kruger was just aching to lure the next little kid into his rusted, bloody boiler room. He didn't just kill them. He'd lure them in, promising them candy and toys and whatnot. Then he'd trap them, keeping them locked in the boiler room for hours, just to watch them beg and cry. He loved it when they cried, especially the little girls, because they were just so fragile. Then he'd corner them, scare them, terrify them, and finally when all of their innocence had been taken away, he'd kill them slowly with his knifed fingers. He threw their dead bodies in the furnace to be burned, leaving no evidence, just in case. Kruger was plotting his next move when the parents of Springwood joined together and set the whole plant on fire. They stood together, taking justice into their own hands as they watched it burn to the ground. Fred Kruger was dead. But that wasn't the whole story. Ash felt as if he'd heard enough. He'd seen disgusting excuses for human beings, but this story made him gag. Buck and Anthony continued to tell him that, yes, Fred Kruger was dead, but only for a short time. Ash kept waiting to hear that he came back from his grave to swallow people's souls, and unfortunately no one had a shotgun on hand, but he never did. Many years after his death, children were reportedly dying in their sleep. They would have such horrific nightmares, they claimed, that they were afraid to go to sleep, believing that they would die. These kids have reported seeing a man in their nightmares with burnt skin, razors for fingers, and went by the name Freddy. What Buck and Anthony couldn't explain, however, was exactly how this Freddy guy would appear in a bunch of teenagers' nightmares and kill them in their sleep. So with their long and sordid tale at an end, Ash left them and carried on, less confused but more afraid. Hail to the king, baby. Ash's shift was over at 5 p.m., and normally he'd return home, relax for a bit, and move on to his night job of demon slaying. But something more important had caused him to make a change of plans. He hightailed it out of the parking lot and got on the road. As he drove, Ash took one hand off the wheel and dug in his shirt pocket. He pulled out the note that read the words, Clot 2, Verata, Nick 2 just to remind himself one last time, because this time he planned on doing it right. All right, I think I got you now, he said to himself. Ash drove off into the sunset with one destination in mind, the old demolished power plant on the edge of town. Chapter 4 The road stretched out for miles, winding from left to right on the outskirts of Springwood. This part of town was pretty much desolate. It had no homes or schools. Even most of the trees were decayed and barren. Even so, the tallness of the trees on both sides of the road enveloped the pathway. The rickety branches creepily loomed over as if forming a tunnel high above the road. This was a sight all too familiar to Ash. As he slowly drove down the narrow road, he examined the nature, or lack thereof, surrounding him. He had a gut feeling that the Necronomicon had to be hidden somewhere in this isolated area. The further Ash drove, he could see a small figure in the distance. He figured it must have been the old power plant. He cruised his way out of the trench of woods and into the open trail that led to the plant. It was completely deserted and there was not a shred of plant life to be seen. A strange feeling washed over his entire body, like his conscience letting him know this was a bad place to be. Before he knew it, he ran over a dip in the road which caught him off guard. 
The sudden rise and fall of the car caused him to slam on the brakes, stopping the car to a screeching halt, nearly causing him to bang his head on the steering wheel. He looked up and noticed he was right in front of the power plant. I gotta stop daydreaming, Ash said to himself. He stepped outside his car and walked up to the building, surveying it. It was about 50 feet tall and appeared to be 5,200 square feet. It was quite a large facility, although most of the building's structure had been demolished. The plant was condemned shortly after Freddy was murdered, so the building eventually decayed over time. The ground was laden with bricks, pipes, and other kinds of debris. The twin smokestacks still held up. The one on the left was covered in grime and soot, while the right had been cut off in the middle. The rim was cracked and pointed like a crown. The sun had set behind the power plant, forming a silhouette all around the building, and contrasting the orange-pink coloration of the sky with the utter blackness that surrounded the plant. Ash walked around to the left wing of the building and saw the lower level. It had rows of window openings on each side of the walls, but no glass. There was black soot that spread from the top of the windows and upward. Ash walked closer towards the lower level and heard a crunch at the base of his shoe. It was broken glass. This must be where all the action happened. Ash pushed on the metal doors, but they wouldn't open. They were covered in too much rust. Ash rammed it once with his shoulder, then twice. When he banged on it for the third time, the door finally busted open. It made a horrible creaking noise as it swung open. The whole area was pitch black. The only light that came through was from the door and the openings in the window panes. He tried turning on the light switch, but no go. Ash opted to just take the flashlight out of his coat pocket and navigate with that. The boiler level was so spacious and high. It was like a huge rusted cave. If the book was here, how was he even going to find it? He explored it for a while, tunneling his way through all the boilers, water heaters, and the swarm of pipes that surrounded him. He explored every corridor of that twisted metal maze. After a while, he was climbing up the metal stairs, nearing the top level. He glided his hand across the railing for support. They were cold and brown with rust. Ash looked down below to the ground and nearly got vertigo from the height. His head was spinning, so he figured it would be best if he just kept looking straight ahead. The grating creaked with each step he took. Out of nowhere, Ash heard a loud squeal, piercing his eardrums. He jerked his head in the direction it was coming from, searching with his flashlight. So many questions raced through his mind in that fraction of a second. What was that? Is this old rickety grate giving out? Am I going to fall to my death from up here? Was that a person? Is there someone else with me? Am I hungry? Does this Freddy guy still roam here? Why didn't I burn my boomstick? Following the squilling noise was a loud clunk. A pipe broke loose and fell down behind him. Ash sighed in relief and laughed a little bit to calm himself. He pointed his finger at the pipe as if it fell on purpose. Yeah, real funny. He turned back around, stepped forward, and was immediately engulfed with chains hanging from the ceiling. He gasped in surprise. He could have sworn he didn't see those chains before. There were several wrapped around him, like boa constrictors. He examined them more closely. He grabbed one and held the flashlight above it. It was covered from top to bottom in dried blood. Blood that belonged to a little boy or girl, most likely. Ash let go of the chain in disgust and wiped his hand on his pant leg. He unwrapped himself from the chains. All right, Ash said. Get it together. He assured himself and resumed down the stairs. He was back down on the lower level and ready to just give up and go back home. He walked closer to the exit when the light from his flashlight spotted something that caught his attention. There was something on the floor, just slightly left of the double doors. He looked down to the floor and saw more dried spotted blood, except it was in some sort of a trail. Ash veered away from the exit and decided to follow the dark red line. He noticed a large furnace nearby and walked toward it. Maybe it's hidden in there. He opened up the furnace door but didn't find the Necronomicon. All he saw was remnants of tiny rib cages, little broken skulls and other bones. 
Ugh, he said in disgust. Those two weren't lying. He resumed following the trail. Finally, when it stopped, it ended on what appeared to be a cellar door on the floor. Of course, he said bitterly. It's always got to be in some godforsaken cellar. He opened up the door and used his flashlight to search the entryway. It was pretty deep. Ash looked behind his shoulder and noticed that it was already dark outside. Should I really be wasting my time like this on the possibility that it might be here? He wondered. He looked back down into the cellar. It probably won't take that long. Might as well. He went for it. He delved deep inside the earthen floors of the cellar. This was the part of the boiler room that was completely hidden and isolated. So, of course, it was perfect for Freddy to hide. Or to play. Little games with the children. Ash found himself in the main corridor of the cellar. It was much like the rest of the whole boiler level, just smaller. He passed through all of the pipes and pressure valves and didn't find a thing. Trenching a little further past all of the equipment, Ash did find a tiny room no bigger than a walk-in closet. A feeling of strange uneasiness increased within him. The hairs on the back of his neck stood up, and he instantly got goosebumps across his forearm. It's here, somewhere. I just have a feeling about it. There was a shovel in the far corner of the room. Without a second thought, he grabbed it and started digging the ground beneath him. He broke away the foundation with the shovel, digging deeper and deeper and deeper. Clink! Finally, at around four feet under, he stopped. There it was. He could see it with his own eyes. Natorum de Monto, the Book of the Dead. It still looked faintly similar to how Ash remembered it. The book was wrinkled and rotted, and rightly so, since its front and back was constructed from human flesh. The front cover formed the shape of a disfigured and demented grimace, as if the book itself was being tortured. It was pretty much the same, except it had a little more wear and tear. My God, Ash gasped. There it is. Ash threw the shovel aside, making a loud noise as it hit the floor. He dropped to his knees. He wiped the sweat from his forehead and extended his arms, ready to grab the book. He stopped himself right before his fingers touched it. Wait, Ash said to himself. The words... The words... Jeez! Almost forgot. He cleared his throat and sat up straight, preparing himself. He inhaled deeply and professed the words dramatically. Klaatu! He shouted. He paused for a moment to remember if that was correct. Verata! One more to go. Nosferatu! I mean, Niktu! Niktu! Ash became nervous. Last time he screwed up like that, an entire army of the dead rose from their graves and came after him. He didn't want that to happen again. He said it one more time. This time a little quieter, more genuine. Klaatu! Verata! Niktu! Ash pulled the book out of the dirt and held it close to his face. He smiled in content, regaining his breath from the overall adrenaline he put himself through to find it. Ash looked dead straight at the Necronomicon. Finally, he said. Soon, you and I are going to be no more, buddy. to the king, baby. It was pitch black by the time Ash had left the building. His muscles were sore from having to excavate and dig to find that book. He stumbled his way to his Oldsmobile, popped the trunk open, and threw the Necronomicon inside. It landed smack dab in the middle, between an issue of Fangoria and an outdated chemistry textbook. 
He fiddled through his keys, finding the right ones for his car, and unlocked it. He opened the front door and immediately felt a long, clawed hand grabbing him by the back of his collar, pulling him back. The figure yanking him back made a rasped hissing noise. Ash knew it had to be a deadite. He elbowed the creature in the ribs, releasing its grasp. Then he quickly whipped around. hey -ya! Ash yelled as he kicked it hard in the chest, knocking the demon down. While it was on the ground, Ash reached in the passenger seat for his boomstick. He aimed it at the deadite and took the safety off. He looked at the creature for a moment, waiting for it to get back up. It appeared to be a woman. She had long, reddish hair. It may not have been red hair, it could have been blood-stained hair. It was too dark to tell. Her jawline had been elongated and disfigured like a gargoyle, revealing a set of rotting green teeth. Her skin was grayish and flaky, like it was peeling off of her, and her eyes, her eyes were blank and bloodshot, with black circles under them. Then, the she-demon leapt up quick as a cat and said to Ash in that distorted, monstrous voice, You will not stop us! His time is coming, and he will be free, and you shall die! And who might that be? Ash teased the deadite, never breaking away from his target. The demon jerked her neck back and forth and left to right, making a gut-wrenching snapping noise as she did so. Freddy! The demon laughed sinisterly. He will return, and you will be his servant to hell! She laughed gleefully. Oh yeah? Ash said, nonchalantly. Tell him I said this. He pulled the trigger, blasting the demon in the head. Her head exploded into little bits, spraying blood and brains all across the dirt. Her eyeballs and chunks of her brain scattered everywhere, like pieces of popcorn strewn across the bloody ground. Ash was surprised. Huh, I didn't think those deadads had brains. She was just a body without a head now. Her neck gushed a wave of black blood across the ground. Her spine was partially exposed above the cutoff point in her neck. The rest of her body just laid there. Her legs were bent opposite directions, and her gray, decrepit arms were permanently locked upwards. Ash placed his shotgun back in the car. He started up the engine and left the abandoned power plant. His red tail lights shrank in the distance. He escaped the rusted tomb, leaving nothing but a trail of dust and a dead-eyed corpse behind. Chapter 5 The darkness of earthly hell surrounded him. He was trapped between two worlds, between our own and one much darker, much more sinister and destructive. Enveloped by the malign fires, with black smoke under his feet, Freddy Krueger stood tortured as he was being forever pulled between the spaces of the living and the dead. This was the fine print and the part of the deal he made when he sold his soul to the dream people. Shredding innocent blood and feeding off their young souls would keep him strong, but when the killing stopped and he was banished back to the evil realms beyond, he was weakened. Freddy was back into the eternal darkness, the everlasting pain. After what seemed like a hundred lifetimes caught inside this evil abyss, Freddy had an epiphany. No longer was he going to follow the law of the demons. Countless times he had been defeated and stripped of his power. Freddy set his sights on a new target, the source of his power, the ultimate source of demonic evil, the Necronomicon Ex Mortis, Natorum Demanto, the Book of the Dead. Whatever they called it, it is the foundation of supernatural evil, the evil that has spawned countless others to do its bidding. With it, Freddy would never be defeated again. He would be immortal, eternal, forever. 
All he needed now was someone to get it for him. Hail to the king, baby. He had the Necronomicon. After all these years, after all the torment and deaths he had suffered through, Ash had finally claimed the bane of his existence, and he finally did it the right way this time. It was his to destroy. Then why didn't it feel like a victory for him? Why did he feel this overwhelming sense of dread clouding his mind? Ash pulled into the driveway, turned his key, and stepped out of his banged-up yellow Oldsmobile. He slowly walked past the front of the car and grazed his hand across the hood, feeling all the dents. Every bump and scratch he felt brought back a different memory of adventures past. Most of those memories were grueling terror mixed in with a little medieval torture. He opened the passenger door and took his Remington out of the car. Finally, he walked over to the trunk and popped it open. There it was, still in the same place, right in the middle just waiting for him. There was a full moon out that night. The pearly light glimmered against the dark blue sky. The light of the moon spotlighted on the Book of the Dead. Ash picked it up and absorbed it for a moment. All right. Now what? He wondered. He'd never made it this far without royally screwing something up. He looked down at his watch. It was getting pretty late. I guess this can wait until tomorrow. He decided to put it back for now and slammed the trunk down and walked over across the lawn and stood in front of the house. He stood and looked at the house for a long time. He'd seen the front of that house every day for a while, but Ash had never really seen it for what it was until now. They were right. It was indeed a murder house. It was once the home of Freddy Krueger, a sick, perverted bastard. All of the weird dreams, the nightmares... What did it all mean to him? He listened to what Buck and Anthony had said. But Ash didn't believe in urban legends. He only believed in what he could see, touch, and feel, and what was trying to kill him at any given point in time. And the foul things that lived in the book made no trouble making their presence known. For all he knew, Freddy Krueger was dead and rotting in the earth. Ash walked up the front steps and opened the front door. The door opened wide and made a low, creaking noise. Every bone in his body ached in pain. His head was swimming, making Ash walk a little unbalanced. He took slow steps and tripped on himself a few times as he walked past the staircase in the front of the room and on to the door that led to the basement. The door was adjacent to the living room. He opened it and was immediately met with a thin closet-sized entry leading downstairs. He made his way to the basement which was lit by a single light bulb hanging from the wall. He grew accustomed to this particular setting. He walked across the spacious room to his workbench. He laid his double-barreled Remington next to his chainsaw in the top left corner of the bench. Two other weapons of his were on the bench, a pump shotgun and a 9 millimeter pistol. Both were taken apart to be cleaned at a later time. He just kept thinking about the rotten, leathery face of that book. Calling beckoning. All Ash could think about was how to destroy the damn thing. The Book of the Dead had survived thousands of years, hundreds of natural disasters, dozens of plagues, and one average everyday excuse for a chosen one. How would tonight be any different? He'd accomplished enough in the last seven hours, so Ash decided to call it a night. He grabbed a rag off the side of the bench and used it to wipe the sweat and the droplets of blood off his face. He could work on destroying the book tomorrow. Right now, he was tired. Ash was so exhausted, he didn't even want to bother going upstairs to the bedroom. The couch will do just fine for now. He planted a seat in the middle, grabbed the remote, and turned on the local news. That would usually put him out for the night. The television turned on to Channel 6. KRGR, the local news station. Ash fluttered his eyes, drifting in and out of consciousness, as he listened to the soothing narration of the attractive brunette anchor woman. The police have no further details on the disappearance of Audrey Hamilton, a teacher at Springwood High and a mother of two. The anchor woman was sitting behind a desk. In the far corner was a reference picture of the missing woman. She was smiling, her hand on her cheek, 
with her elbow propped on her desk. Her hair covered most of her face. Her hair was long and red. Red hair. Ash sat up straight and became more alert. It was her. It was the same woman who attacked him earlier. Except her skin wasn't decayed and her jawline wasn't deformed, making her look like some kind of gargoyle. She was just a normal woman in that picture. Happy, smiling, and full of life. Oh, how things can change so quickly. The newscaster continued. On a related, more disturbing note, the bodies of other missing persons have been found, mostly outside of town. Their limbs severed and... Ash turned the TV off. He didn't want to hear any more. He set the remote on the coffee table. He buried his head in his hands and took a long, deep breath. This was one of the more depressing parts of the job, realizing that he'd just taken the life of what was once an innocent human, someone who never did anything at all to deserve this, seeing their faces on the news and watching their friends and family mourn for them. Sometimes it was just too much for him. He rubbed his eyelids, trying to somehow wipe away the sadness from his face. Click. The TV turned back on. But how? Ash had put the remote away. His eyes went wide as he jerked his head up to look at the television. Their heads decapitated in some of our findings. There was the newscaster again. Her demeanor was somewhat different. Her serious face and genuinely caring tone was replaced with a coy smile. She sounded like she relished every word. Their skin had been decayed far past their presumed time of death. When she began that sentence, her voice changed. With each word, it had slowly gotten lower, like a man's. Although even a normal man's voice wouldn't sound this guttural and wretched. What's going on here? All of the bodies had what appeared to be fatal wounds with a type of saw and shotgun blast to the head. Her voice by now had gotten just downright evil. Freddy. The police suspect, that bastard, Ash Williams, will hunt that rotten son of a bitch down like a no good, dirty dog. Ash turned away from the television screen and locked his eyes on the remote. He had no idea what was going on, but he didn't want to suffer through any more of this. The background noise still echoed as Ash quickly grabbed the remote and searched for the power button. Yeah, you're chosen all right. Chosen to have your fucking skin ripped off. <laughs> Ash turned the TV off again and threw the remote to the edge of the living room. What the? Ash mumbled. His eyes went in every direction, searching, waiting for something else to freak him out. Nothing. Ash exhaled deeply and leaned back on the couch cushion, trying to relax for a moment. He stared at the ceiling and watched the propellers on the fan slowly spin. He watched him intensely, sitting just on the edge of the couch next to Ash. Freddy stared at him with a foreboding gaze. He took pleasure in this part of the game. Ash was getting weaker, debilitated. Freddy watched his bloodshot eyes flutter. His skin had gotten paler, like he'd just seen a ghost. That part never got old. Poor Ash had tried to stay awake, but it was already too late. Freddy cocked his head to the side and wriggled his finger blades in anticipation. Now, the torture could begin. Whoa! Ash yelled. He jumped in his seat and whipped his head to the right. He could have sworn he heard the sound of knives clinking next to his ear, but there was nothing there. Ash breathed heavily. Whatever he saw, it sent shivers down his spine. The goosebumps on his arms reappeared. He had no clue what was going on, but he knew one thing. There was someone in the room with him. He looked around him, but there was no one there. He figured it must have just been his imagination, nothing more. He looked at the wall clock across the room. It was past two in the morning. He'd been awake more than 17 hours. Of course, he'd be hallucinating. Seeing and hearing things that were not and should not have been there. Becoming nervous and a little paranoid from it all. He'd had a rough night, and he was very fatigued. He needed rest. 
Of course, he thought. E everything's fine. All I have to do is relax. Clunk. 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 Ash heard a noise coming from upstairs. Huh? What? What was that? He thought. It sounded like footsteps. Slow, creeping footsteps. Is there someone upstairs? All of the windows were locked. There was no way someone could have broken in without him hearing something. Then he heard a different noise this time. It came from different parts of the house. It was a very loud creaking noise like the foundation settling. Ash turned in all different directions trying to locate where the sound was coming from. But it came from everywhere. It was a multitude of various creaks and other kinds of racket. Ash leapt from his seat and stood in the middle of the living room. He was alert and ready for whatever was going to happen next. Without pause, the doorknobs on the front and back entrances started to rattle and shake violently. The doors themselves produced loud banging noises like someone was beating on them from outside. Something bad was going on, and Ash knew it. He remembered that he had put away all of his gear in the basement. Boomstick! He leapt over the couch and raced toward the basement door. When he put his hand on the doorknob, he instantly felt a white-hot stabbing pain across his palm. Ah! Ash yelped. His left hand had been burnt. He quickly withdrew it. He looked at the doorknob. It was glowing red from the heat. Ash figured he didn't have a lot of time, so he quickly used his metal hand to open the door and flung it open. He stepped forward to go down the stairs and felt as if he was going to fall. Whoa, whoa, whoa! He looked down, and there were no stairs, just empty blackness. He readjusted his balance and stared down the bottomless chasm of darkness. What was going on here? First there was a basement, and now there wasn't. What? Am I in the twilight zone? What's going on here? Before Ash could begin to absorb the fact that his basement had just completely disappeared, the entry to what used to be the basement was immediately engulfed with flames. They rose from the bottom up. Before Ash was about to become, well, Ash, he quickly slammed the door shut. He needed a weapon. That much was certain. He hastily scoured the living room for something he could use. Then he found it. The metal poker from the fireplace. He ran back to the living room and grabbed it. When he turned around, he noticed that all of the noise had ceased. It was completely quiet now. But still, Ash stood hunched over, ready to attack. His back to the fireplace, looking over the whole room. His eyes were wild, and he had sweat dripping from his forehead. What was going to happen next? But still, Ash appeared confident on the outside, grinning and cocking his eyebrows, challenging whoever or whatever was pulling the strings here. Come on! Come on! Just try me! He said, still catching his breath. This poor bastard isn't giving up without a fight, Freddy thought. He had to admit, it was a little more fun messing with someone who had a little bit of personality. Someone who didn't just stand there expressionless like an idiot. And at least he fought back. Well, if one could call that fighting. It was different than just some doe-eyed bitch in her nightgown, running and screaming for help. But still, this still bugged the living hell out of Freddy. Why did it always have to be so difficult coming back from the dead? He thought. He watched him, huddled up and shaking like the poor sap that he was. He delighted in his torment. Freddy cracked an evil smile. He stood to Ash's left, though Ash couldn't see him. He wanted to kill him right then and there, slice his throat open maybe, but he was powerless without the Necronomicon. Soon enough, he said, while Ash was oblivious to his presence. I'll have that book and your soul along with it, but I'll have to wait until you're weak enough to finish the job. He needed to weaken Ash, completely remove his strength and his will to survive. Then it would be the perfect time for Freddy to strike. But until then, Freddy inched a little closer and reached out his gloved hand, slowly. He flicked his index finger forward and tapped Ash on the shoulder. Tap, tap. Ash 
Josh felt a tap on his left shoulder. It felt sharp and pointed like a knife. He whipped his head around, but there was nothing there. He felt like he was going insane. All of these strange and horrible things were happening to him at once, and there was no one in sight. What bothered Ash most was not knowing who was doing these things to him. Things that didn't make sense. The banging on all the doors. The basement just disappearing. The roaring fire. Feeling like there was someone standing right next to him the whole time. His mind snapped. He gripped the fire poker until his knuckles ran white. His chest puffed in and out from breathing so heavily. If whoever wasn't going to show their ugly face, Ash was going to try to at least coax them out. Come on, show yourself. His tone was infused with rage and desperation. Come on down. I'll poke your goddamn eyes out. Let's go, he shouted. His eyes went everywhere, looking up the stairs where he heard the footsteps. To the front and back doors where all of that noise started. To the basement door where he was met with a wall of flames. Don't think I won't, he muttered fearfully. He took a few steps to his right, moving to the corner of the living room, his back still to the wall. His senses were raw, and anticipating anything to happen at this point, he was ready to strike at any second. The light bulb inside the floor lamp in the corner of the room flickered off and back on again. It was just for a split second. Ash saw something out of the corner of his eye. He wasn't going to take any chances. In just a fraction of a second, Ash struck in that direction. In the corner to his right, Hey up! Ash yelled as he swung the fire poker like a baseball bat at the floor lamp. It fell and knocked over to the wall shelf next to it, and the sweat from his hands caused him to lose grip of the poker. Ash felt like a total idiot. He bent over and reached for the poker. When the lamp fell over and hit the shelf, it hit with such brute force that it dislocated one of the brackets, propping it up. The shelf was bent at an angle, and the lantern that was on the corner of the shelf was now wobbling. It fell right off and landed on the top of Ash's head. He was knocked flat to the ground. He groaned in pain. He felt a knot in the back of his head, throbbing as he slowly got back up and put the fire poker back in his hands. Ash heard a strange noise coming from the kitchen. He was still recuperating from his head injury, but decided to check it out anyway. The closer he walked towards the kitchen, the sound became clearer. It was like a low hissing noise. Ash braced himself and gripped the fire poker like a bat once again. He was now in the kitchen, following the noise. It led him towards the refrigerator, where the cause of the sound was just a simple hiss. Ash lowered the metal poker and loosened his grip. He breathed a sigh of relief and turned back around to the living room. It's all right. Relax. Relax, he assured himself. He put the fire poker away and propped it on the corner so he could wipe the sweat from his brow. Ash stepped back into the living room. Meanwhile, the stereo in the back of the room turned on. A little blue light shone indicating that the power had turned on. In an instant, the whole room was encapsulated with the brazen sound of shrieking death metal. The floor vibrated, and Ash's eardrums pierced from the sound of that ungodly high volume the stereo produced. He put his hands up to his ears to try to muffle the sound, but it was much too loud and boisterous. Ah! Ash screamed in pain. He fell to his knees and tried to plot a solution. He looked around the room and saw that some of the furniture had come alive. The little tassels on the curtains, the lamps, the books on the shelf, they were dancing. They were bending and contorting to the rhythm of the music. It was disturbing and distracting. He had to make it stop. He crawled over and reached for the fire poker and decided to make good use out of it. Ash stood tall, raised it above his head and swung at the stereo with brute force, smashing it. Shut! Crash! The Crash! Hell! Crash! Up! Crash! The stereo had been smashed and broken into little pieces. The music had stopped. It was finally quiet. Ash dropped the poker to the ground and exhaled in relief. He was dripping sweat from the top of his head to the back of his neck, matting down his short, dark hair. He closed his eyes and paused for a moment to think and figure out what was going on here. 
This was all so surreal that it just didn't feel that it could really be happening. But it was real to him. Everything felt real. Just like the dream from last night. The scorching heat from the fire. The throbbing pain in the back of his head. The feeling that his eardrums were being torn apart from inside his head. Could this all just be a dream? <laughs> there was that laugh again. It wasn't as loud as last time. It was quieter, guttural, echoing. Ash opened his eyes and looked straight forward. Freddy was right in front of him. He stood mere inches from Ash's face. He could see Freddy clearly now, but he wished he hadn't. Even though that old brown ratty fedora covered most of his face, what did show was simply repulsive. His skin was burned and disfigured. Little sinews of decayed flesh had been peeled off of him and hung across his face. Even whole chunks of his face had been missing, showing bloody muscle tissue. But he was smirking, showing hints of rotted fangs for teeth. Freddy quickly urged his face closer to Ash's, and with that low, echoing voice said, Boo! Ash screamed at the top of his lungs, flailing his arms and legs. He flipped over and landed face first on the hardwood floor. When he looked up, he saw the light of dawn showing through the curtains. Ash looked around and noticed he was lying right next to the couch. He had been sleeping the entire time. He pushed himself back up, sending a shock wave of pain across his bones. He muttered and groaned as he got back up. Ash had slept in his clothes from the day before. He noticed the dried up blood stains on his shirt as he dusted himself off. He felt a sharp throbbing pain in his left hand. He held it up closer to examine it. As he looked at it, Ash noticed a large red burn mark on his palm. As Ash combed his hair back with his fingers, he realized that maybe it was time to start believing in those urban legends. Hail to the king, baby. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been chapters 3, 4, and 5 of Freddy vs. Ash by A.S. Eggleston. I am deeply, deeply sorry for the long period of time since the last upload of this book. I've been dealing with some personal issues, uh, some work issues, and have been sick a couple times since then, and it seems like every time that I get around to being able to narrate, something would happen where I'm not able to. Um, I was barely able to get out the podcast and the Slash Tracks episodes uh, since the last time I put out a narration of this book. I'm going to try to make sure that I put these narrations out quicker. I really want to because we got some great stuff coming up, uh, like Friday the 13th Part 5, the novelization, a fan novelization, uh, written by Landon Turner, who you will remember also wrote the Friday the 13th Part 4 fan novelization, and it was an amazing job, very much in the vein of uh, Simon Hawk. And he's also working on a novelization for Part 7, and I believe he's going to do uh, Takes Manhattan and also Jason Goes to Hell. So that's going to be really awesome to have every Jason movie in book form here on the channel um, I would also one day like to be able to narrate like a Freddy's Dead fan novelization if someone writes it. Uh, but as far as this book goes, I'm really enjoying the tone, uh, getting right into the action here. We get some cool Deadite stuff. I do have a few questions like how did the Necronomicon end up buried at the factory? Uh, how did he know to go there to get the Necronomicon? Uh, stuff like that. But you know what? It's all in good fun. It's Freddy and Ash. I'm not going to ask too many questions. I'm just going to enjoy uh, the fact that we get these two iconic characters clashing. And it's a lot of fun to be able to voice Freddy again. You can hear it takes a toll on my voice right now. Uh, it's been a minute since I've done it. Um, yeah, I'm curious to see where this story goes. You know, I love that Freddy's fucking with him. And I love the line that Freddy delivered and the nightmare uh, that Ash was having. Like with Freddy, uh, you know, doing the voice on the news and all of that. It, it just, it's a really good job by A.S. Eggleston. Uh, there are a few questions I have, but, you know, 
she probably just had to make the story work and bring them together the best she can. And in my opinion, she's doing an amazing job at that. I am very entertained so far. I'm excited to continue reading this book. If I thought my voice could hold out, I would have put out, you know, maybe another chapter or two with this upload. But I'll be back very soon with more of Freddy vs. Ash. Um, be sure, as soon as I'm done talking here, there's going to be a picture on the screen. It's going to be blurry and hard to see. But if you're the first person to comment in the comment section, what is in the picture? It's going to be from a Freddy movie or from an Evil Dead movie. And if you can tell me what the scene is and what you're looking at in the picture and be the first one to do so, you're going to win some uh, free ebooks that I will send you via email. So until next time, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 Slasher Librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, pleasant dreams, and I'll see you soon. Here's that picture. Let me know if you can guess what it is.